You are listening to continuing coverage of the trial of Chad Daybell from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Let's go back to the courtroom. All rise. Tip your courts now. Test the level. Steve, you have your voice to presiding. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and have our jurors brought in, please. All right, please. Jury's off president of California. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Good morning, everyone. We're on the record now on case CR 2221-1623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. We're continuing with evidence with the state's case in chief. Court will note the jurors are all present, properly seated and accounted for. And the court has received the signed juror affirmations of all of our jurors. So thank you again for continuing to follow the court's instructions. At this time, then, I understand the state will be calling another witness. And who is going to be examining the witness and who will the witness be? I will, Your Honor, and the state calls Katie Dace. Very well. You may call your witness. I solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Thank you. All right, thank you. Before we inquire, I'll just ask, have you been watching any of the trial testimony since this case began? I have not. Okay, have you talked to anyone else about testimony they've given in trial? No. All right, thanks for answering those questions. Mr. Wood, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you may. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Could you state your name and spell it for the record, please? My name is Catherine Dace, K-A-T-H. E-R-I-N-E-D-A-C-E. Ms. Dace, what is your occupation or profession? I am a forensic biologist and supervisor with the Idaho State Police Forensic Services in Meridian, Idaho. So is is that a lab? It is. Uh, Do you know if that lab is accredited? Yes, we are accredited by the American Association for Laboratory Accreditation. Additionally, the biology... The biology section is accredited to the FBI quality assurance standards. And how long have you been employed by the Idaho State Police Forensics Lab? Since 2016. Is that the first forensics lab you've worked at? No. Uh, What other labs have you worked at? I began my career in 2008 with the Denver Police Department as a forensic biologist. I worked there until 2012 at which point I went to work for a military contractor performing DNA testing overseas for approximately one year. After that, I went to the Texas Department of Public Safety in Austin, Texas, for approximately two years before coming to Idaho. And would you describe for the jury your educational background? I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Forensic Biology from West Virginia University. And did your formal education include the study of DNA? It did. Did that education include hands-on work with DNA testing techniques? Yes. At each one of my employers, I completed a formal training program encompassing the duties that I would perform. Uh, These included things like scientific literature reviews, practice samples, practice cases, oral and written exams, uh, competency cases, and supervised casework. And are you certified by any boards? Yes, I am certified by the American Board of Criminalistics in uh, Molecular Biology. And what are your duties and responsibilities at, at the Idaho State Forensics Lab? I examine items of evidence for the presence of biological fluids and material and attempt to generate DNA profiles from those items. I will then compare DNA profiles I obtain to known reference samples in the case and as a supervisor, I handle case management and personnel matters. Ms. Dace, did you receive evidence in the case of uh, the state versus Chad Daybell? I did. And is that evidence identified in your lab by the number M2020-2233? It is. In general, what evidence did you receive into your lab in this case? I received autopsy samples from J.J. Vallow including oral swabs, rectal swabs, penile swabs, hand swabs, and nail swabs. Uh, We received tape from around his hands, ankles, mouth, tape and plastic from around his head, and tape and plastic that the body was wrapped in. 
I received two swabs from an apartment in Rexburg, Idaho. I received tools and a necklace from the Daybell property. And I received known reference samples in this case for JJ Vallow, uh, Tylee Ryan, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, Melanie Gibb, Richard Mao, and Dennis Trahan. And did other individuals in your lab also perform work on this case? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibit 421. Uh, this is an Idaho State lab report by Riley Nolan. I believe it comes in by way of stipulation. It's by stipulation, Judge. Very well. Exhibit 421, having been offered without objection, is admitted. Ms. Days, can you just quickly review the first couple pages of that? And what is that? This is a DNA report written by our laboratory. Right. And who wrote that specific report? Riley Nolan. And are you familiar with Riley? Yes, she is my supervisor and our laboratory manager. Right. And do you know what the purpose of that report was? Uh, this was uh, parentage comparisons between um, samples from presumed to be J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan and uh, Lori Vallow and J.J.'s father, Dennis Trahan. And Your Honor, may I publish that for the jury? Yes, you may. I almost called you Ms. Nallon. Ms. Davis, uh, can you... Uh, Explain to the jury the uh, the evidence description, the items that were being tested in this specific report. Uh, there are molars uh, presumed to be from Tylee Ryan. There's a reference sample from Lori Vallow, a reference sample from Dennis Trahan, and we previously obtained a DNA profile from a tooth presumed to be from J.J. Vallow. Um, can you just read into the record the conclusions and interpretations of that report? Yes. So based upon evaluation of the DNA profiles attained from item 23 and 25, Lori Vallow cannot be excluded as being the biological mother of the deceased individual said to be Tylee Ryan. The single parentage index for the loci examined is 2,528,000,000. At least 99.9999. There's four nines of the female population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the biological mother of Tylee Ryan. So that's not language that most of us usually use, right? Mm -hmm. Can you uh, explain to the jury what that, uh, what that conclusion and interpretation means? So you get half of your DNA from your mother and half from your father. And so at every location, you are expected to share uh, DNA from your parent to your child. And so this looks at the DNA between the presumed child and the parent and compares whether or not that person could be the parent of that individual. Um, in this case, uh, Lori Vallow is included as being the mother of uh, the remains of Tylee Ryan. Thank you. And then if you could read the, the next paragraph and I'll turn the page. The DNA profile obtained from item 32 is consistent with the profile previously obtained from item 21, an additional reference sample from Dennis Trahan. And if you could read that top. Based upon the evaluation of the DNA profile obtained from item 32, as well as the profile previously obtained from item 16.1, Dennis Trahan cannot be excluded as being the biological father of the deceased individual said to be Joshua J. Vallow. The single parentage index for the loci examined is 5,602,000. At least 99.9999 of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the biological father of Joshua J. Vallow. And again, because that's not language most of us use, can you just briefly explain what that said for the jury? It said that Dennis Trahan cannot be excluded as being the father of those remains. So he is included as being the biological father. Thank you. So, Ms. Dace, we had, before we went over that lab report, talked about uh, some of the items you received in uh, this case. Uh, did you mention receiving bags? Yes. Uh, let's talk about those. Um, what, what kind of bags were they? What did they look like? Um, it was a white plastic, appeared to be a grocery bag from around the head, and there was tape on it. And then 
there were several black, what looked like black trash bags that were wrapped in tape that the body was wrapped in. Um, however, those items, when we received them, had already been removed. Uh, so we received just the tape and the plastic separately. Uh, from those bags, were you ever able to locate or generate a DNA profile from any material located on those bags? So I did not do any DNA testing on the bags. I did do DNA testing on the tape. Uh, so I assisted Tara Martinez in collecting hairs and fibers from the tape. Um, most of the tape and plastic had decomposition fluid present. Um, and so I tested those items for blood and they were positive. Um, when examining the tape, I was looking for irregular edges that could indicate someone might have torn the, te uh, the tape with their teeth and left behind saliva. Uh, so I did solve a few of the tape ends. And then after uh, latent print processing, I went back and swabbed areas of an identifiable fingerprint reach detail in an attempt to get a DNA profile. Were you able to generate any profiles? I obtained one DNA profile from the tape uh, from JJ's hands, and it was consistent with him. JJ. Uh, you said that some of the fluid tested positive for blood? Yes. Is that accurate? Um, and where was that located specifically? Um, on all of the tape and the plastic. And did you do any DNA testing on that blood? No. Why not? Um, it was presumed to be the victims um, during decomposition. Uh, you know, your body breaks down. And so uh, decomposition fluid often has blood in it. And um, a lot of the tape still had uh, lots of small hairs and apparent skin attached to it in addition to the blood. And all of that would be expected to be uh, JJ's DNA. You, did you receive a chain and a pendant? Uh, as part of the items that were brought to the lab? I did. Did you test those for the presence of blood? I did. It was negative. Uh, you mentioned some swabs from uh, an apartment 175? Yes. Uh, tell us what you did with those items. There was a swab from a knife blade, and it was negative for blood. There was also a swab from a wall, and it was very weakly positive for blood. Um, and that would have been consumptive to test for DNA, so we did not perform DNA analysis. I want to talk to you about some of the tools you received. Uh, do you recall, in general, which tools you received? Yes, I received 18 tools from a garage barn on the Daybell property. They included a post hole digger, a garden hoe, shovels, a pickaxe, axes, shears, and hand saws. Did you do any type of testing on any of those tools? Yes, they were requested for uh, blood and human remains. So I did find quite a few small stains on handles of many of the tools uh, that did test positive for blood. They were very small and uh, would have been consumptive to test. So I did not uh, perform DNA testing on those. On four of the tools, I located what I thought could be human remains and I collected that material, uh, I photographed it, and then I performed DNA testing on a portion of it. Um, so that was on four tools? Yes. Uh, did you take pictures of those items as part of your uh, report? I did. So tell us a little more about that process of when you, you bring in a, a tool or a sample. Like, What specifically are you looking for, and how do you go about testing it? Um, so the first thing we do is we open the item and photograph it. Um, I did collect hairs and fibers if I saw them. Um, some of the tools were quite dirty, so I needed to remove the dirt in order to see the surface of the item. And so I, I did that as well. Um, I also removed some ashes from several of the items. And then I go about looking for stains that um, have the appearance of blood or could possibly be blood mixed with, say, dirt or or ashes or something like that. Um, and then I, I do presumptive blood testing uh, to see if any of these items maybe should be for DNA. Um, Your Honor, I'm going to ask the witness be handed States Exhibit 201A through 201R. The court and counsel have been provided a copy. Right. And on that exhibit, Mr. Wood, it appears that all of those letters are inclusive a through R, correct? I believe so. I'll double check. I confirmed with my courtesy copies, just making sure none were removed out of the sequence. 
No, that should be accurate, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ms. Stace, if you'll just take a second and review State's Exhibit 201A through R, and let me know when you've had a chance to look at it. Okay. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 201A through R? I do. Uh, what do what does that report to be? Uh, these are photos I took during my examination um, of the tools and of uh, hairs and fibers collected from the tape. And you said these are photos you took yourself? Yes. Now, some of these photos have markings on them. Are these markings that you uh, placed on the photographs? Yes, uh, or the item itself, depending on what it was. And are those uh, markings a part of your regular um, testing uh, procedures? Yes. All right. And are these pictures true and accurate copies of uh, the photographs you took? They are. Your Honor, I'd ask that States Exhibit 201A through R be entered into evidence. No objection. Okay. Exhibits 2201A through R are all admitted. Ms. Dace, if I um, ask about item 36.4, do you know which one that is? It's a shovel. Um, and is that a number that your lab assigned to that tool? Yes. Item 36 uh, was a collection of tools uh, from the garage barn. Um, can you tell, uh, well, Your Honor, I'd ask that I'd be allowed to publish. You may. Is that item 36? Is that item 36.4? Yes. Okay. And it's kind of hard to see the writing on there. Tell us what you did with this shovel. Um, I examined it for blood and uh, I did, I swabbed all of uh, the ends of the tools. Um, I did not run them for DNA, but we did swab for preservation. So those dashed blue lines that you see indicate the sampling I took from there. Um, and then I also collected some possible human remains from this item. Can you tell us what we're seeing in States Exhibit 201B? Zoom out for you. So the area on the right side of the photo uh, was what I thought could be possible uh, charred flesh. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but it had a little bit more of a pinkish tan hue than the rest of the dirt and everything around it. Um, so I collected that and then I took a photograph and I ran a portion of it for DNA. And what does the jury see in state's exhibit 201C? This is a close up of that material that I collected. Um, and then the blue box uh, indicates the portion of it that I ran for DNA. Were you able to generate a DNA profile from that material? I was not. Can you tell me about lab item 36.5? I believe it's another shovel. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 201D. Do you recognize that image? I do. I took that photograph. Is that item 36.5? Yes. And what uh, did you do any type of testing on this item? Um, I did the same as, as with the other tools. I tested for blood and then um, examined the tool head for um, blood or human remains. Was there any material that caught your attention? There was. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 201E. What does is, what is the jury see in this image? Could you slide the photo up a little bit so you can see the labeling at the bottom? There we go. Um, so these, this is, again, um, more material I collected from the shovel. Um, it has a little bit different look than just dirt. Uh, it's more tan. And the pieces on the left are very, very small. Um, but the material on the right was a little bit larger. And so I did collect, collect both of them. Um, and the one on the right was what I selected for DNA. I'll show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 201F. Do you recognize that image? I do. What is that? That is a close-up photograph of that material on the right of the shovel. And the blue box on the left uh, indicates the area that I ran for DNA. And were you able to generate a profile? I was not. Your Honor, I talked with the court yesterday about bringing in items or states exhibits 172 and 173. I'd like to ask those be brought in now. They're here. Okay. Your Honor, is there a handheld microphone? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Ms. Dace, if you could approach this table. Can you hear me? Yes. And I, I see you have your gloves on. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dace, uh, the shovel that's present on that table, did, did that have an, an item number in your lab? 
Um, yes, this was item 36.3. Okay. Um, what, when, do you, when you got that, sh that shovel, uh, 36.3, and that's States Exhibit 173, um, I'm just going to refer to it as the shovel, if that's all right with yeah. you. Okay. Uh, when you got that shovel, what did you observe? Um, there were ashes uh, present on it. It was also dirty. Um, there's various staining on the shaft of the tool. Um, and I did test them for blood. And these on this item, they were all negative. And did you observe anything in the blade area of that shovel? I did. What did you, what did you observe? And, and please feel free to show the jury where you observed it. Um, on the back of the shovel, there's a lip on the back edge. And there was some material adhered to the back of the lip that I thought could be human remains. And can you just point to where you thought it was? Right in the lip, right here. Okay. And did you do any testing on that material? I did. I performed DNA testing. All right. And if you want to go ahead and have a seat and we'll... Have you come down again in a minute? And you're on here. I'll continue publishing through the Elmo. You may. Do you recognize? Uh, I apologize. This is States Exhibit 201G. Do you recognize that item? I do. It's a picture of that shovel. The same shovel that we're looking at on this table? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 201H. Do you recognize that picture? I do. It's a picture I took of that substance that's on the back lip of the shovel. Uh, it's circled. And then there's also some very small fragments near it uh, that are uh, pointed to. Uh, the one on the left, the larger piece, is what I uh, ran for DNA. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. Do you, is there a pointer up on that desk? Yes. Could you? I, I realize that it's kind of circled, but if you could just point out to the jury what you see. Right there. And you said you collected and tested that. I did. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 201I. Do you recognize this image? Yes, that is a photo I took of that material once it was removed from the tool. And it says it was taken with a stereoscope. What is a stereoscope? Um, a stereoscope is a type of microscope used to photograph images you can already see with the naked eye. It just gives you better resolution. Uh, this is not that photo. This is a photo just with my normal camera. Okay, I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 201J. And, and what is that? This is the photograph under that stereoscope of the material. And the blue box on the left is the portion that I ran for DNA. Okay. I'm sorry, I was a little distracted by the light shining off. Can you, uh, what did you do with that? The portion on the left, I ran for DNA. Okay. And can you... Uh, Point out to the jury any other labels you have on that photograph. Uh, yes, on the right, you can see that there's some green material uh, caught in this uh, piece of, of uh, material. Um, and it was visible just on just on the right side. So um, I selected the left side for DNA. Were you able to test that green material? No. Is that the type? Does Idaho State Lab do that type of testing in we Viridian? Did. No. Um, were you able to, in regards to the left portion that you tested, were you able to obtain a DNA profile? I was. And how did you do that? Uh, the DNA process starts by breaking open uh, all the cells in the sample to release the DNA. And then I will determine how much DNA I have present in the sample. Uh, I will copy the specific locations we look at for forensic DNA testing, and then I will visualize that DNA profile, which looks like peaks on a graph. Um, and you were su successfully able to generate that profile? I was. All right. Um, did, you, uh, did you receive any known DNA profiles pr prior to your testing? Yes. Once we established the parentage for the tooth presumed to be from Tylee Ryan, we used her DNA profile as her reference sample. And did you compare this, the DNA profile from this material with Tylee Ryan's sample? I did. What were the results of that testing? Uh, the DNA profile from this item matched Tylee Ryan. It is at least 604 octillion times more likely to see this DNA profile if Tylee Ryan is the source than if an unrelated 
randomly selected individual from the general population is the source. Can you say that number one more time? 604 octillion. How many zeros are in an octillion? An octillion is 27 zeros. Thank you. Ms. Stace, can you tell me about lab item 36.1? It is a pickaxe. Do you see that lab item in this room today? I do. Right, would you be willing to again approach this table? Yes. Can you tell the, uh, well, one, can you hold up and identify that item for the jury? Yes. So one side has labeling uh, and then one side has uh, no stickers. I can't hear you. Now. One side has uh, labeling and then the other side does not have any stickers. Ms. Dace, did you, what, if anything, did you do with this pickaxe? Again, it has, it's States Exhibit 172, lab number 36.1. And I, for uh, clarity's sake, I will just refer to it as a pickaxe. Uh, what did you do with this pickaxe when you received it into your lab? I examined it for blood uh, and it did have some stains that tested positive for blood. I also examined the uh, head of the tool, which was dirty, um, and I removed the dirt that was adhered to the surface. And underneath that dirt, I found what I thought could be ashes uh, and human remains uh, embedded in the eye of this pickaxe, which is right here. And I collected those, uh, photographed them, and then I ran some of it for DNA. So when you received that item, it didn't look the same way it does today, correct? Correct. You kind of described it, but if you could just describe what it looked like when you received it. Um, all of these circles that you may see, uh, I made those. So those were not there. Um, and again, it was dirty. Um, the, the blade had a fair amount of light brown dirt adhered. And so again, I had to um, remove it. I also uh, ultimately swabbed the head of this item. So um, I have swabbed this whole area. So it, it's much uh, less dirty than it was. Um, there did appear to be some possible uh, burn marks in, in the item as well, um, in addition to the uh, burnt material that appeared to be inside the eye. And you, you can go back to the stand. Just really quick, um, I did want to point out um, there are two stains here on the pickaxe, and I did ultimately run those for DNA as well. Ms. Stace, I'm going to show you on the Elmo what's been marked as State's Exhibit 201K. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes, that is the pickaxe we just looked at. The same pickaxe that's on the table in the courtroom? Correct. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 201L. And if you can describe for the jury what you see... Um, see in this picture? So on the leftmost side of the photo, there's uh, what appeared to be dirt. Um, that was the top surface of what I was examining. And so I removed it and put it off to the side. And then in the middle, what you see is that darker material that was embedded around the eye. Um, and I also collected that separately and um, took a photo of it, and then ultimately I went back through it looking for anything I thought I could run for DNA. And were you able to uh, find anything that you could run for DNA in that? I was. Um, you to look at State's Exhibit 201M. Do you recognize that image? I do. What is that? That is a photograph of some stains on the handle that tested positive for blood. Were those the two you pointed out to the jury? They were. I'm going to go a little bit out of order. I'm going to show you what's been marked as states 201O. And if you can tell the jury what you observed in, in this image and what you were doing. So that, that is a photo of the tool once I removed that top layer of dirt. And I haven't removed the dark material from the eye. Um, as you can see, it's um, all around the um, shaft and... Um, it's, it's a little hard to see because it's dark, but it's basically in between the metal and the shaft as well. And then it's adhered to the surface of it. And now I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 201N. What is that? Uh, that is a photograph of some of the larger pieces of material that I removed from that dark pile of, of debris from the eye. 
I'll show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 201P. Do you recognize that picture? I do. And what does it represent? It is a portion of what was in the previous photo. It was the largest piece of material I found. What did you do with that? Uh, the area in the blue box is the portion that I ran for DNA. Were you able to obtain a DNA profile from that subject? I did. I obtained a partial DNA profile. And can you explain for the jury what a partial DNA profile is? Um, it means that at some of the locations we tested, we did not get results. Um, that's very common in samples with a low level of DNA or samples that are degraded. Well, and when you say degraded, what could cause degradation? Uh, heat. So being uh, subjected to a uh, fire could, could cause that degradation. And when you obtain a partial DNA profile, are you still able to do a comparative analysis against a known profile? In this case, yes. Okay. Um, is it accepted in the scientific community to do a comparative analysis with a partial profile? Yes. What were the, re uh, and in this case, did you do that comparative analysis? I did. Uh, what did you compare it against? I compared it against the known reference samples I had in this case. And can you just remind the jury what those known reference samples were? Um, at this time uh, that I was doing this examination, I had a reference sample from J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, Lori Vallow, and Chad DeBell. And from your comparative analysis, did you come to any conclusions? Yes, Tylee Ryan was a possible contributor to that partial DNA profile. Um, it is at least 159 trillion times more likely to see this DNA profile if it originated from Tylee Ryan than if it originated from an unrelated, randomly selected individual from the general population. Okay. And, and again, that's kind of, for lack of a better word, scientific speaking, uh, just for, from a layman's perspective, how would you describe that? So it means that all of the locations we tested where we had information, the peaks that were present were the same peaks that were present in Tylee Ryan's reference sample. Thank you. I'm going to go back to States Exhibit 201M. You mentioned, I believe, that you did some testing on those two spots. Yes, I tested them together for DNA. And did they initially test positive for blood? They did. And can you tell the jury how you, uh, the process by which you performed your DNA testing on that blood, on those blood spots? Uh, it was the same as what I ex uh, explained previously. Um, I would swab those uh, stains and then I would break open all of the cells, determine how much DNA is present, copy those locations that I test, and then visualize that DNA profile and if I do get a DNA profile, I will ultimately make comparisons to reference samples in the case. Were you able to obtain a DNA profile from those from those samples? I was. Uh, and were, uh, were you? Did you perform? I, I'm sorry. Did you perform a comparative analysis between that profile and any any other known profiles? Yes. What was the? Were you able to reach a conclusion from that comparative analysis? I was. What was it? Um, this DNA profile also matched Tylee Ryan. And again, it is 604 octillion times more likely to see this DNA profile if Tylee Ryan is the source than if an unrelated, randomly selected individual from the general population is the source. Ms. Stace, you spoke earlier about examining duct tape. I did. Is there a priority of different types of forensic testing for an item such as duct tape? Um, for this case, um, given the amount of um, blood and decomposition fluid and skin that was present on uh, quite a bit of the tape, it was going to be difficult to find foreign DNA. Um, and so we did collect hairs and fibers, um, but ultimately we gave the preference or the priority to latent prints that could uh, better establish a direct connection between the tape and the person who handled it. And you mentioned collecting hairs. Uh, yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as states exhibit 201Q. I don't know if you'll be able to make out what's on there. But do you recall taking these pictures? I do. And I, I understand it's difficult to see after it's been photocopied. But what, uh, what was this a picture of? 
Um, each one of these uh, adhesives contains one or more hairs and fibers that were collected uh, from the tape pieces we examined. And states exhibit 201R. What do you observe there? Um, those, again, are more hairs and fibers collected. If you can see the yellow circles on the yellow uh, up at the top, those are indicating where those are. And are these some of the hairs that were collected from the tape and plastic that was wrapped around JJ? Yes. Did you attempt to obtain DNA profiles from any hairs in this case? Uh, yes, we ran several hairs for DNA. Were you able to generate any profiles? No. And so if you don't have a profile, you, you can't compare it to a known profile, correct? Correct. Are you, Ms. Stace, are you aware if any of the hairs collected were sent to uh, private labs? Yes, I believe some of them were. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 200. Court and counsel have courtesy copies, and I believe this will come in by way of stipulation. Okay, Exhibit 200 has been offered. Is there any objection from the defense to admitting it? There would be no objection. All right, Exhibit 200 is admitted. Ms. Dace, if you can just briefly look at that. Are you familiar with that document? I am. What What is it? This is a report from uh, Bodhi Technology, which is a laboratory in Virginia. And Your Honor, if I may publish that. You may. And are you aware of what items were sent to Bodhi Laboratory? Yes, one of the hairs that I collected um, from the tape um, on the, what we called the body bag, so the tape and uh, plastic that the whole body was wrapped in. Now, to be clear, you did not perform this testing. Correct. Are you familiar with the type of testing that was performed uh, and documented in this report? Yes, the DNA typing technology is the same that I use. And in Ms. Dace, understanding that this is not your report, uh, but that this is an item stipulated to you by the parties. If, if you could just briefly at the top up here describe the item numbers that were sent. Um, S25, which is a DNA extraction of the known reference sample of Lori Vallow. Um, v23, which is the DNA extraction sample for Tylee Ryan. And item 46, um, which appears to be the reference DNA extraction of Melanie Gibb. And I'm going to point uh, your attention to here where it says STR processing results, conclusions, and statistics. Could you, and I will make that a little bigger for you, if you could just read that into the record. DNA profiles were provided for the following samples. S25, Lori Vallow, Daybell, V23, Tylee Ryan, and 46, Melanie Gibb. And if you'd read the next couple paragraphs there. The partial DNA profile obtained from sample CCB2235-02.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
which represents the Bode Laboratory report. My understanding is this is being, uh, there's a stipulation regarding the uh, admission of Exhibit 48. It's been previously provided to the state. Any objection on 48? The state doesn't have an objection to the Bode Lab report coming in. I, I, I do believe we've already just admitted it, though. So I don't know if it's if we want two exhibits with two identical exhibits with different numbers. Okay, can we do have the Bode Technology Laboratory report three pages that's already states exhibit 200? Yes. Is that the same thing as exhibit 48? From my understanding, it is, unless it's... Judge, my recollection was that it was a little longer than that. If, I'm going to need my computer, Judge. Could I? May I have permission to approach my uh, desk over there? Yes, and we'll also let you review exhibit... For uh, 200, because if they are exactly the same, then we don't need cumulative identical exhibits. The um, review of my exhibit uh, 48 also includes uh, uh, some of the chain of custody information, as well as a complete report, including all of the analysis. It appears to have about 180 pages. Okay. If that's the case, then uh, those would be different exhibits, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't be cumulative. Uh, Mr. Wood, has the state been able to consider whether or not there's an objection to exhibit 40. Your Honor, there is no objection to that. Okay, so defendant's exhibit 48 is admitted. Judge, could I have just a quick moment with Mr. Wood? Yes. Judge, in addition, uh, defense has an exhibit 49, which, which is an Astria report uh, that's entered by way of stipulation of the parties. It's the understanding that Ms. Dace is not going to be discussing the Astria report today. Correct. Um, However, we are agreeing to enter that report with further discussion on that report potentially in the future. And your honor, the state's position is we don't, we're not going to object today to that. However, uh, at some point, if there is not someone qualified to speak to it, we would renew an objection. Okay. At this point, uh, although there's a stipulation, if this witness has nothing to say about the report and where it is a technical report, I'm going to deny admitting it at this time uh, without prejudice to renew an offer to readmit it if someone's qualified to discuss what it means. So Exhibit 49 is not admitted at this time. And Judge, may I proceed? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Dace, can you uh, tell me approximately how many tools you um, uh, were provided to you in this case for your analysis? I believe there were 18. Okay. And did you test all 18 tools? I did. Okay. And you had mentioned something about the uh, positive for blood. On how many of those tools did you, did you obtain had a positive test for some sort of blood? I would need to look at uh, my report to be sure. Do you have your report here today? Uh, yes. May I, uh, Judge, may I have Ms. Dace be provided to her, her report? And then Ms. Dace, uh, I'm sure you're well aware, you review your report and when you're done, set it down and we can discuss that if that's okay. Yes. All right. You can review that to refresh your recollection. When testifying, don't read from it or read it into the record, please. Okay. Thank you. I'm finished. So uh, of the first 10 tools that I looked at, all but one uh, had small stains that tested positive for blood. And were you able to determine whose blood were on all 10 of those? I'm sorry, how many? Uh, nine. Nine. Yeah. Of the 10 you initially tested, or the, the nine had were positive for blood. Were you did you do any follow-up to determine whose blood was on those nine tools? No, all of those stains were very small um, and they were consumptive for testing. Okay. Now you mentioned that um your your um occupation obviously is to do DNA analysis of of uh, of things for the state police. Is that right? Yes, uh, our laboratory serves um, all Idaho law enforcement agencies and prosecutors' offices and public defenders' offices. Okay, and can you talk to me a little bit about um, the manner in which DNA can be, um, in terms of uh, how DNA gets on, on various tools? Well, there's uh, more than one way. So obviously the the most direct way is primary transfer, which is um, the the blood or um, whatever we're looking for makes direct contact with that tool and leaves it behind. Um, there's also what's called secondary transfer, which is um, if it was on the blood was on something else and then it touched another object, 
it could potentially transfer. Um, dried staining is much harder to transfer. Um, but when it comes to things like handler or touch DNA, that can be more common. And and that's not the only limitation on DNA. DNA can be uh, can be placed on an item by way of of something like sweat. Oh yes, yes. Um, so there's different ways to leave DNA. Um, obviously, the major fluids are blood, semen, saliva. Um, there's urine, uh, hair, as we talked about, and then also. Uh, what we would call wearer DNA or handler DNA. So um, I'm leaving behind DNA on uh, my suit jacket right now from wearing it um, from sweat and just skin cells um, or the gloves I was wearing earlier. My DNA is likely now on the inside from wearing them. So in any situation uh, such as the pen that I'm holding right now, when I set this down and and someone were to take this, uh, there's a strong likelihood that my DNA would be on this pen. Yes, it's possible. And that would be in the way of uh, skin cells? Yes. It could be by way of perspiration? Correct. It could be by way of just uh, uh, my breath breathing and I, I, please forgive me if I spit or if I, uh, there's some sort of uh, air fluid that comes out, my DNA could be found on that as well by way of me just simply breathing on this pen, correct? Yes. And uh, the second set of tools, you said the first 10, then how many did you, did you look at after that? Uh, it would have been eight. Okay. And on the eight uh, of those eight remaining, we've already talked about the first 10 and the nine of them had blood stains on them, right? And potential blood stains. Okay. And then of the remaining eight, how many of those had any uh, indications of DNA on them? None. Okay. And on all of these 18 tools, did you examine all 18 tools? I did. Okay. On any of these 18 tools, well, let me preface it with this. Um, was it your understanding that, that these 18 tools came from the garage of Chad Daybell? Yes. And when did you get uh, possession of these tools on what day? I would need to look at uh, our laboratory report. Mr. Bailiff, I'm sorry. We're working overtime today. There's more to come in the trial of Chad Daybell. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our continuing coverage right here from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast.